the cycling podcast in association with Rafa. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Where are we, Lionel? We are in central London, uh, just outside or just a little bit along from our new home venue, Vermouteria, the, the Vermouth themed cycling themed cafe in Coles Yard not happy, far from King's Cross Station happy with that pronunciation Daniel Freib. Um yeah they're all the rage aren't they um, Vermouth uh, yeah. there are, there are lots yeah, of them in Mallorca and Berlin actually well uh, do you have a do you three. have a favourite Vermouth Daniel no I'm not I'm not really into it I don't really understand it Napalm um, I keep meaning to actually uh, be, sort of do a bit of research and find out you know what it's all about when you drink it, what you drink it with, and what are the faux pas, what are the big social faux pas to avoid, which obviously is always a big topic with me. <laughs> so so basically, I'm not prepared to discuss it until I become a vermouth snob. <laughs> 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 oh, brilliant. That's a, like. a principle by which Daniel has, has lived very well so far, so yeah. um, good luck with that. Uh, welcome back, Lionel. Oh, thank you. Uh, Are you feeling you, yeah. better? Week off. Uh, getting there, yeah, getting there. You had a week off, did you? Well, I've got a week off now. I've got um, a week. <laughs> I did have a week off for my uh, week off. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but, uh, well, welcome back. Now. You're looking well in the, in the London sunshine. What was wrong, Daniel, you're yeah. I had a week <coughs> off. Oh. A cough. A cough, cold, just laid low. Um, uh, in the parlance of uh, professional cyclists, I had a, a viral infection and uh, I was off the bike. The for sensations a week. were not good, were they? The sensations were <laughs> terrible. Um, you know, it d- didn't start any of the stages last week, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was with you, Daniel. I, sh- I should open this week's episode by apologising for the, the noise in last week's episode of the, the road. I, mm. I got the recording levels a bit wrong. Um, so I do apologise for that, but hope it added to the the atmosphere. Oh, it was wonderful from my sick bed listening to you guys on a on a Mallorcan roundabout <laughs> during rush hour. Was it wasn't just actually that busy. It was entirely <laughs> my fault. I was using Daniel's recorder, which is exactly the same as mine, but for some reason felt unable to adjust the recording levels. So. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, it's like riding somebody else's bike, isn't it? The yeah. sensations weren't yeah. good. <laughs> the sensations <laughs> weren't good. However, the sensations were good, obviously, um, podcasting with, with you in Mallorca, Daniel, mm. back now in London. Um, in this week's episode, we're going to hear from TJ Van Garderen, who has made his debut for Education First, uh, and it's looking pretty good, a new start for him. Uh, and we're going to hear from Sepp Van Mark, their, that same team's classic specialist as we look ahead to Het Newsblad at the weekend and Lionel you're heading out there um, that's the that's the season proper for you isn't it yes it is really and I you know I don't want to don't want to totally discount everything we've talked about since the start of January but um, it does feel like the proper beginning of the season to me anyway but then you know I'm old school you, are, um, you certainly are you, know. uh, you certainly are well, well we'll hear from from those who we've got a few other things to talk about as well but can you give us a new round up please i can yes again another uh, bumper week of news first of all rich sorry i, I did provide some notes for mm-hmm. last week's news roundup which you inserted uh, which a couple you, of errors in there too. i did insert a couple of errors for you that you didn't fact check um <laughs> the, the you sent me them five minutes before we started recording well i was in a i was in a feverish state rich you know the temperature was very high um accuracy dipped to sort of 58 59 percent i think um but the one kind of gray area in the news roundup was regarding um uh, the belgian rider who's had a hip replacement rides for one group bart Goubert. de clerk bart de clerk that's right and uh the team and de clerk himself said he's the first pro to have a hip replacement um i meant to insert in the notes just floyd landis question mark because we know floyd landis had first a hip resurfacing and then he did have a full hip which replacement. is what andy murray has just had yeah, and there's a difference, isn't there? Because you've had your hip replaced, of course. I have. Um, so Full replacement. My hip surgeon is a podcast listener, Marcus Banks, if you're listening. You will be. Uh, great. Very good. Very good man. Anyone he, needs if anyone, hip anyone looking for a hip replacement, he is your man. But Landis had his hip replaced and then did return to racing of some kind at some level, basically. Yeah. So happy to clear that up. Anyway, the racing, loads of racing. Uh, the Tour of Oman concluded... 
Astana's Alexei Lutsenko wrapped up his second consecutive victory there for Astana. Um, Astana's run continued at the Ruta del Sol with Jakob Fulsang winning overall. His teammates Jon Izagirde and Pelo Bilbao were second and fourth with Steven Krauswijk of Jumbo Visma in third place. Tim Wellens, who's been in good form this season so far, won a couple of stages including the time trial and Matteo Trentin of Mitchelton Scott won a couple of stages as well but probably the outstanding performance, individual performance of the week was Simon Yates' solo stage win into Granada. Um, probably talk about him a little bit once the news roundup is uh, concluded. Just a little bit over from the Ruta del Sol, which is in southern Spain, the, the tour, the Volta al Algarve um, in southern Portugal, won by 20 year old Slovenian Tadej Pogacar, who won the Tour de l'Avenir. Um, uh, one of a number of very talented young riders um, pulled off the victory with a perfectly timed stage win ahead of Walt Poles, Enric Mass and Sam Oman. Um, possibly benefited a little bit from a little bit of weakness in Team Sky's train. Teo Gagan Hart looked very strong, but then um, David de la Cruz kind of let things slip a little bit, left Walt Poles with a little bit too much to do, and Pogachar pulled off the stage win there. And everyone's now seen Remco Hu. Exactly, yeah, that's how quickly it changes, doesn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, look, I mean, we, we had a little feature on Team UAE Emirates, UAE Team Emirates, they're actually called, aren't they? In last week's podcast, if you can hear that, against the drone of the buses and, and trucks in Palma. Uh, but we spoke to Jeroen Swart, their medical director, and got a little bit of a sense of the, 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 the overhaul in the backroom team at that team. Um, and they re- yeah, and sorry, Rich, Daniel. we mentioned Machin Fernandez, didn't we, the... the mm. The gentleman who was responsible for scouting Podachar, um, who, as you say, everyone now is predicting, will be the next. Eddie Merckx, the latest in a, a long line. Um, but there are plenty of cautionary tales, aren't there? Um, I, there are a few few people posted online over the weekend, the last uh, riders to, uh, to win stage races of that kind of age or stage races of that level. Um, Thomas Lovequist was younger than Podachar, when he won the Circuit de la Sarthe in 2004 and his career um, ended up being a bit of an anticlimax, didn't it? Oh, boomed and bust, didn't it, really? Um, had that very good couple of years with HTC Columbia. Not sure what they were called at the time, actually. Were they just Columbia? And then, but didn't quite work out for him at Sky, did it? I think he'd tra- he too much too young, Thomas Lovequist. He, tra- he, was, he was a big trainer, I think. he poss- There was a, a, yeah, I mean... I know the. I saw the the tweets you're you're talking about. Um, I mean, there aren't many twenty year olds. Bernardo Ruiz uh, was twenty years old when he won the Tour of Catalonia in nineteen forty five, um, and uh, it's a long time since somebody that young has won a stage race of that level. Wilco Kelderman won the Tour of Norway in twenty eleven, but it was not quite the same category of race. Uh, so, a real standout achievement, and he look he looks. He looks, he looks good. I mean, he looks... Well, the cycling media can heap the uh, yeah. expectation on Pogacar's shoulders like a game of buckaroo. And I think, see, Daniel, see you might have called him cracks. Podachar, did you there, around uh, Pogacar? Pogacar, Pogacar? I know, I know Slovenian is not your not your strong point, so I'm, I'm hoping for the emergence I've, I've of nailed, of I did in, in last talented week, Slovenian riders. Uh, in the last week, I have nailed the pronunciation of his first name. It's like the word today in Cockney, like today. I looked it oh, up it? today. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. The, the stress Thank on you. the first syllable. Today, Pogachar. Yep. Well, anyway. it's probably a name we're going to be saying a lot. Indeed. A uh, helicopter went over a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, that it was like a bike race was approaching, TV. wasn't it? We're, are we live now on TV? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sticking with Algarve, de Koenig, uh, won the first and last stages with Fabio Jakobsen and ZNX Dibar. Uh, Stefan Kung of Groupama FDJ won the time trial and Dylan Gronewegen of Jumbo Visma won the other sprint stage. At the Tour du Haut Var, a three-day stage race in the south of France, as it is now. It used to be a one-day race, then a two-day race, now a three-day race. By about 2050, it'll be as long as the Tour de France at this rate. Um, Thibaut Pino won after winning the final stage on Mont Ferrand, the famous climb that uh, climbs above too long. The other stages were won by EF Education first Set Van Mark, who we'll hear from a bit later on, and Trek Segafredo's Giulio Ciccone. Pino won overall ahead of Bardet and EF's British rider Hugh Carthy. 
more Astana success with a stage win from Mahari Kudus at the Tour of Rwanda and the World Tour resumed with the UAE Tour which is the first edition of a merger between the Abu Dhabi and Dubai Tours few days in now uh, Jumbo Visma won the team time trial uh, perhaps some signs of that progress in your friend special Rich um, mm. hearing about how um, they have, have worked as a group Fernando Gaviria won the first sprint stage and Alejandro Valverde got his first victory in the rainbow jersey uh, Yebel Hafit um, he also won there in the Abu Dhabi tour last year as we speak Primoz Roglic is leading overall still a few days to go in the UAE tour so not done yet there's a women's stage race in southern Spain, the Setmana Valencia, only ranked 2.2. But as there aren't so many four-day uh, women's stage races worth a mention, in fact, in the World Tour, only the Giro Rosa, the Women's Tour and the Holland Tour are longer. Uh, anyway, the, sta- the race was won by Clara Koppenberg of Germany. Finland's Lotta Lepisto won two stages there. Worth mentioning uh, Koppenberg's race for WNT, a team that's really stepped up this year. Uh, Lisa Brenner and Kirsten Wield have joined that team. They've been around for a few years but uh, they uh, nobody's really talked about them but they look set to be quite a a force and that was an incredible ride by Koppenberg a a real talent off away from the racing it's been confirmed that the 2021 Tour de France will start in Copenhagen capital of Denmark Um, second Grand Tour start for Denmark after the 2012 Giro started in Bjarne Reese's hometown Herning looking forward to a weekend in Denmark there'll be three start saving And then a rest day slash transfer back to France, um, which is a slight departure for the tour. The Giro is certainly sort of, um, you know, trademarked almost this this uh, big start that then has a, a transfer day back to the host countries. Um, Team Sky's rider Ben Swift is out of hospital after spending a few days in intensive care after a pretty nasty training crash in Tenerife where he was riding with Geraint Thomas. He ruptured his spleen, um, unsure at the moment when he'll be back in racing. British cyclocross champion, 10-time British cyclocross champion, Helen Wyman has retired. She was also twice European champion and world championship bronze medalist. And Belgian rider Victor Campanets has confirmed that his hour record attempt will be in April. April the 16th or 17th in Mexico at altitude. The women's hour record was set there by Vittoria Bussi of Italy last September. Campanets of Lotto Cidal needs to beat 54.526 kilometres. That's Bradley Wiggin, Wiggins' record. And what's the feeling? Is he going well, to do it? We heard from him, didn't we? A few weeks ago, Daniel spoke to him about his our record ambitions uh, yeah, I think. is I, this a bit earlier than we expected Daniel no, around about the time when he was thinking of doing it um, I was slightly struck when I spoke to him in Mallorca um, uh, by the I wouldn't say haphazard nature of his planning but certainly it seemed fairly well less less kind of assiduous and forensic than, than Bradley Wiggins is, had been um, or was in 2000 was it 2014 I couldn't I had a bit of a a mental block earlier um, today. I was trying to think. Would, I can't remember if I was actually at that hour record. In you North certainly Island, were. I, I think I you was. Certainly I think were. I was, but I have no recollection of it. Whatsoever. I think we've all blanked out because it was a very stressful uh, occasion for us, wasn't it? That? We did a live podcast ah, from Track <laughs> Central, if you remember, Daniel, and we only just got on air with about a, a minute to go. We were the second most shambolic broadcaster on that day because Sky, who was showing it live, missed the start. <laughs> they were on the adverts when, uh, when Wiggins actually uh, pushed off and then just had 59 minutes and 40 seconds on earth, of uh, I can't, action. I can't really remember now. How on earth did we... Did we commentate or broadcast on an hour record for an hour how well, do we keep the that evidence going? is there if you want to go back and oh listen God, to it no. furrowed brow and, and head in hands i think it's uh, a, it's an event best followed on teletext isn't it um but can <laughs> can he do it i mean I, I refer to his his preparation then i mean what really struck me was when he talked about his bike for the hour record and he said well there is no specific there's no special bike we're not we've not done any real work on that ridley have got a good track bike and that's what i'm using um which as i say was in certainly in contrast to my recollection of of the kind of hype and, and preparation that went into the Wiggins uh, record attempt also um, you know the pedigrees of the of the various riders that have, have attempted it um, Wiggins certainly had a a uh, more impressive Palmares than Campanets currently has and Rowan Dennis um, certainly has has more or better credentials as a time trialist than Campanets 
has, although Campanets is, is himself a very good time trialist. So I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, there are other riders, um, a couple of Danish riders who have attempted it over the last couple of years who have surprised me with how close they've got to the hour record. Um, I was... I refreshed my memory the other day. I was reading Thomas, Thomas Decker's book, um, The Descent, which I would highly recommend. It's a fantastic book, um, a sort of doping memoir. But he also talks about his our record attempt. Um, he, he, he had a go when his career was pretty much over on the road. And um, he wasn't that far away at the time. Um, the, 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 the bar has been raised slightly since then. But Thomas Decker at that point was pretty much washed up as a road rider. And, and Kampenertz is, is in his peak peak years so and, and he i mean unconventional is is the the word that springs to mind in his approach he's been training in namibia as well and i know he complained about having not been drug tested um while he's been out there he, he was he was surprised that uh, he hadn't been drug tested which uh, you know uh, no matter where people are training you would hope that they would be drug tested especially if they're going for something like their record but um he for all that his preparation might not be quite as meticulous as Wiggins, he will have the advantage of of the thin air in Mexico, um, and but, he'll be acclimatized to that. Yeah, he will, Rich. But um, there's a there's a payoff to that, isn't there? Because it's mm. obviously, uh, I mean, it, it's a difficult equation. If you listen to people who have attempted the hour record or thought about attempting it at altitude, then um, obviously you, you go through the air quicker, but um, it's harder to, to breathe and take in oxygen. So and I think most people think that the, the benefits outweigh the, the disadvantages there. Finish up with the news. A um, few little other bits. Uh, the Tramadol ban comes into effect this weekend. Omloop he- Newsblad will be the, the first race where Tramadol is completely banned um and a little story in het newsblad the newspaper the belgian newspaper from the uci uh, they're beefing up the fines for littering and, and throwing bidons water bottles a uh, thousand swiss francs fine roughly 750 pounds um slightly strange story this is sort of one of those throwaway remarks that's um that's that been extrapolated out into a, a news story it felt to me because uh, i don't really see how the regulation has changed um Remember, green zones were introduced in about 2014, I think. Uh, these are the areas where riders can drop their litter with impunity and it will be cleaned up after them. Um, it seems that uh, the, the two things that, that the UCI want to clamp down on are uh, littering, obviously, which is, you know, there's, there's really no excuse for it, certainly when it comes to the gel wrappers um, that could just be put back in the pocket. And uh, that's important, I think, because it sets an example for um, general cyclists, sports riders people just out riding their bikes to, to take their litter home really no excuse for dropping it on the side of the road um, anyway whether you're competing or not um, but the bidon issue is a trickier one because we see riders throwing them away sometimes in quite a what looks like quite a reckless fashion you know a big high arc um, but the the priority is not to throw them onto the road so that they cause other riders danger um, the idea is to try and clear the road and get them into frankly into the hedgerow and um, but I think from a sort of the, the optics of it are not great the, the look of the peloton riding along throwing uh, bottles away the irony is they want to not have bottles being thrown near spectators where they could be a danger but if they are thrown where spectators are then the fans will run and gather them as souvenirs so it's a it's a kind of a strange one and it's one of these until you see how the rule has been written it's going to be interesting to see how they discriminate between you know who does get a fine and who doesn't get a fine what will be the circumstances it's it's gloriously unclear as some of these uci um missives seem to be Uh, but that will come into effect this weekend um finally the world track championships get underway in pruskov in poland uh richard were you there in 2009 yeah, yeah it was a good one wasn't it i enjoyed yeah it. it was great yeah it was um so we'll keep an eye on that it's uh one of the stories that will probably get quite a lot of traction in the uk is the return of victoria williamson who broke her neck back and pelvis in january 2016 at the rotterdam six day uh in a very bad crash she made her comeback at the hong kong world cup this january she returns to the world championships and will do the sprint at 500 meters quite a lot of uh um, stuff about her comeback on the BBC's website which and is worth about look. her injuries uh, on the second podcast Femina uh, a couple of years ago we had a, a long interview with her and it was it was remarkable her determination was remarkable it's been a long much longer journey than she anticipated 
And as I said, it's the opening weekend in Belgium. Omloop Het Nieuwsblad and Kerner Brussels Kerner. And 20 years since I first covered a professional bike race, Rich. Can you believe it? I mean, don't, don't look a day over 60. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much to our headline sponsor, Rafa, um, and the latest instalment of the Gone Racing, their series of behind-the-scenes films with EF Education First, has just gone gone up. Uh, it's uh, well, it's from the the Tour Colombia, um, the Tour of Colombia, I want to call it, uh, and it's mainly a focus on Rigoberto Uran, their sort of talisman. Uh, a hugely popular figure in Colombia, and that certainly comes across in the in the film. Um, uh, and and just the w- there wasn't a lot of TV coverage, uh, or it wasn't easy to watch the tour of Colombia. So uh, it's a, a nice um, little flavour of what it was like and what the atmosphere was like and the Colombian fans and so on. So um, that's highly recommended. Go to Rafa.cc, or you'll find it on the Rafa channel on YouTube. Um, that's the latest Gone Racing episode. Uh, what caught your eye then in, in all the, the, the recent racing that we've just heard about? I mean, uh, an obvious one in Pogacar, we, we talked about him. Uh, you know, a few riders catching my eye. David Godou um, in um, UAE rode extremely well to... He was the only guy who could go with, with Roglic initially. Um, you know, Jumbo Visma have been very impressive there as well so far. Roglic looks strong. But David Godou... Just yeah, sorry, Daniel. Joe, just on teams as well, Rich. Um, I mean, I know we, we keep referring to it, but um, Astana's run of form. Yeah. So they've had 13 victories to date. And the most extraordinary thing I think about this run is that none of those have been in sprint stages. And usually when teams rack up a lot of wins, there's a sprinter somewhere in there who's who's rattling off three or four. Um, and the number of general classification victories they've had in stage races to date is just staggering I mean they won um, Valencia they won Murcia they won Colombia Tour La Provence uh, Ruta del Sol with Fuglsang um, Oman with Lutsenko and they're well placed as well with Kudus to win the Tour of Rwanda the, the, the question uh, I mean everybody is asking is t- to what extent uh, do we credit the Astana rap I mean, how much? How much <laughs> has that? How much has that been a factor? Do you think in this incredible run? It has been building for a while. I have to say. I mean, Astana. It was interesting because going to last season, they looked. They, they'd lost Fabio Aru. They'd lost Vincenzo Nibali, and it looked like they'd had their head cut off to some extent. You wondered where these wins were going to come from, and then if you remember exactly a year ago, there were exactly a year ago. In fact, there were questions about payments. Um, salaries had not been paid. There was uncertainty over the future of the team Michael Valgren won Het Newsblad and that was all he was asked about but around that time you got the sense that the, the team was sort of galvanised and and these guys who'd always been capable of great performances like Valgren started delivering and it's just really carried on from there and it got me thinking Rich as well about um, this period of the season and we, we've spoken in the last couple of weeks about Tim Wellens I was, I was very tickled by I can't remember who it was that tweeted at the weekend um, um, about the threat that global warming poses to Tim Wellens um, and his career because he seems to thrive at this time of year when it's particularly um, when, it, when it tends to be quite cool. Um, but there are so many stage races at this time of year, and you know later in the in the episode, I think we're going to talk about TJ Van Garderen. And sometimes when we think about stage races, we think in terms of well, are they going to do GC or are they going to go for stages or possibly at a stretch, you know, they could start focusing on one week stage races instead. But actually, you know, there's such variety at this time of year um, to to rack up not easy wins but um you know there, there are a lot of opportunities to win three day races four day races five day races there's really something there for for everyone in the the sort of galaxy of, of stage race riders and and that's really what astana have done i mean they've won with a variety of different riders in a variety of different ways and um, relying on their time trialing ability their climbing ability and um, you know over three days four days five days and um you know taken a, a lot of pressure off themselves for the rest of the season because it's frankly they're not going to win a grand tour they're, they're not you know they don't have somebody at, oh sorry I, I forgot about Lopez mm. gee whiz I forgot about Lopez they, sorry they, will, they could well win a grand tour he's the one guy though that, 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 that's capable of that you know the rest of them are um, 
as you say, capable of, of winning at, at the level that they're winning at the moment. I think the, 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 the interesting thing is, is that certain riders seem to be winning, uh, you know, specialising almost in this um, time of the season or winning in the same places or similar places, uh, you know, sort of streaks, even Valverde winning on the same climb uh, in the Middle East. You know, there's quite a bit of this going on. Tim Wellens has won in the same place in Mallorca. Um, I think he's won uh, in the Ruta del Sol before as well. Uh, I'm not, not yeah, he won that. Ruta del Sol last year. That's right, yeah. So uh, there's kind of riders who are obviously got their focus on this part of the season. But you, you say, Daniel, it takes the pressure off. And to a degree it does. But um, it, it soon gets forgotten, doesn't it? When the bigger races start coming, the classics and then into the Giro, um, the, these wins kind of, they, they have greater importance now while they're current, obviously. Um, and they do, they do put a little bit of money in the bank so to speak but um, you know the, they don't rack up a great deal of interest in, in, in ooh, ooh. <laughs> I don't mean <laughs> no, I don't know I people aren't interested in them but you know you, yeah, Astana's spring streak can soon turn round on them and if they don't win anything in, uh, in the classics or the, the grand tours the question will be well how come they were so good in, in the spring when it didn't matter and now they're going like a um, bag of spanners bag of spuds. Yeah. That, that's true Napalm I, I would say from an egotistical point of view from an individual rider's point of view um there's there's very good reason to come into the f- come into the season pretty hot and target mm. some of these races because um you know we've seen it in the last few years and particularly last year with uncertainty about it only takes one sponsor or a, a couple of sponsors in the in the world tour um there ends up being a bit of a mad dash in in August and September to get a contract and if you can start racking up results early in the year and you're in a position to to sign sign a deal or or shop yourself around in in May and June I think there's a massive advantage to that so um, you know those guys um, the the ones of them that are out of contract at the end of the year the guys who have already racked up good results in these races in February are, are very much enhanced their their um, their market value and of course there's a lot to be said for just getting out on the front foot racing and trying to win as we saw with Simon Yates at the Ruta del Sol I mean um, you, 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 you can't be churlish about it we want to see the best riders um, giving giving it some uh, welly whenever they get um, they they get on the start line and uh, to see particularly the way Yates raced I mean the, the day that was kind of false flat that Trentine won where he was riding on the front with a couple of teammates I mean clearly working training working training but also then when the road went upwards and, and he had the opportunity to get away he um, he got up the road on his own um, so kind of a double edge to it uh, preparing pre- preparing preparing <laughs> preparing for the bigger events to come um, but also just rediscovering rediscovering the sensations of, uh, of winning Ooh. yeah and Simon Yates as well as catching the eye with his performance caught the eye with an interview that he gave in the Spanish press didn't he yeah he did Rich um, some very eye catching quotes from that um, particularly about the Tour de France and his lack of interest for the Tour de France we know that he's not well he doesn't plan to do the Tour de France this year or it's certainly not going to be a priority he might roll out of the Giro and and end up starting the Tour but the the Giro is his number one priority and he said um, to a Spanish website chiclo21.com that he really doesn't doesn't feel very enthusiastic about the Tour at all it's just another race for him and he gets much more excited about the Tour I'm sorry the Giro and the Vuelta um, he was he was hinting. He didn't go into a lot of detail about why this was. It's more of a, a sort of emotional, visceral thing. But um, he was sort of hinting that the the route itself tends to be much less exciting in the tour, certainly from his point of view, and also just everything that that goes with the tour, the hype, the um, the. The, the sort of media presence which he doesn't particularly relish um, and he feels that the at the Giro and the Vuelta it's much more about the bike racing and, and that sort of tallies with what we see from Simon Yates um, he's someone who well, I think is his biggest asset really is, is his ability to sort of zone in and focus on racing and um, he's well it's much easier to do that at the Giro and the Vuelta there's, there's less pressure there's less attention um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, there, there won't be any foie gras hampers 
and winging their way to to Simon Yates's pied in Andorra after that interview we, from ASO. Uh, I, I think the the obligation to say that the tour is uh, the most appealing to, thing to you in the season. I mean, doesn't he should feel no obligation to say that if that if he prefers the Giro and the Vuelta and the style of racing, good on him for saying it. Um, because you know the tour is like a sort of. Uh, you know, it's a bit like a sort of business conference, isn't it? it it's work. It doesn't look. It doesn't look like there's the same opportunities to, um, to, to, you know, express yourself as a rider. The, we see how much um, importance is placed on just those little flurries at the end of stages. You're you're effectively waiting and waiting and waiting for sort of four or five kilometres of racing. Um, on each given mountain stage. Yeah, I know it, it's loosened up a little bit and peak teams have tried things. Um, Lotto Jumbo last year um, notably really went all out on the Alpe d'Huez stage, but it didn't work. And there are very good reasons why it doesn't work. Whereas in the Giro and the Vuelta, there's a, you know, there is a, a more freedom and a more opportunity to um, make things exciting. And if it's exciting for people to watch, it, it's more exciting for the riders, I'm sure. You know, being being away up the road making the race happen putting people under pressure behind got to be more exciting than sitting in a group of 20 that becomes 18 that becomes 16 and 12 and then five and then going pop um you know there, it is more dynamic racing often and, and just finally on yates chaps do i have permission to make a fool of myself always daniel i thought you might say that um well i was thinking about simon yates and i was it, it occurred to me that of the, the current peloton um, he is probably one of the two riders that I would be most confident of winning another Grand Tour or winning a Grand Tour from here until the the end of time. Um, I think he's he's a he's coming into his peak years and uh, was so impressive at the Vuelta last year. Anyway, um, last night I, I got thinking about this and I did a bit of a ranking um, of of the likelihood in in descending order. Um, I think you're, riders, you're on your own out there in Mallorca, Daniel. Riders, <laughs> riders and the, the, the likelihood of riders winning um, a, a Grand Tour between now and the end of their careers. Do you want to hear it? I, I got, to, I got oh, to number 18. Of course. Um, I oh, got to number 18, oh right, so it goes very quickly. Dumoulin, Simon Yates, Froome, Roglic, Bernal, Mass, Superman, Superman Lopez, obviously, Geraint Thomas, Quintana, Nibali, Adam Yates, Roman Bardet, Thibaut Pino, Richie Porte, Mikel Lander, Bob Jungels, Wilco Kelderman, Rigoberto Aran. There you go. Where's Pogacar? Pogacar, he's not on there. We've not seen, he's 20 he years old. <laughs> he should be there. What do you think of that? Evenepoel. What do you think of that? No. What do you, tail, top five. Tail, what do you think of the top five? Hart. What do you think of my top five? Dumoulin, Yates, Solid. Froome, Roglic, Bernal. Simon Yates more likely quite, to win I was a, quite a surprised to hear between I was now quite and the surprised. end of time than, than Chris, for, Chris Froome. I hope... I hope he's not listening, but I was quite surprised that Garen Thomas was so far up there. Yeah, ahead of Lander. You think Thomas is more likely to win a Grand Tour, another Grand Tour, than Lander is... I would yeah, say so. I, I mean, I, I that, yeah. Thomas has got probably two, three more opportunities, would you say? Yeah, but Lander's got more opportunities. Well, exactly. Lander, Lander's got more opportunities, but he's got nowhere near thus far. So, Thus far, correct. Mm. Anyway, yeah. sending you ranking, sending you top 18, everyone. Shoot, uh, shoot that area du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's the voice of Seb PK, race radio at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode is sponsored by The Economist. The Economist newspaper is about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from world politics and business to science, technology, the arts, the environment and even sport. The Economist sifts through the noise, focusing on the essential information that tells the real story in a time when facts matter more than ever. And it's for the kind of person who never stops asking questions and wants to know why the world is the way it is. Now, that's almost a dictionary definition of you, Rich. Oh, very good. Very good, Lionel. What have you been reading in The Economist this week? Well, the article that caught my eye this week, Lionel, was towards the back of the magazine. It's the Johnson column. What we talk about when we talk. Less language than you might think is devoted to conveying information. Obviously not when it comes to the News Roundup and the Cycling <laughs> Podcast. It takes as a starting point a big uh, focus in the New Yorker magazine on the novelist Dan Mallory and his relationship with the truth, uh, which is a fascinating piece to read. Um, but it looks at just how language is more slippery than we might assume um, and how little of it is actually about conveying information and facts. Um, 
again, which is contrary to what we might assume. Talks about a study at Stanford University looking at a thousand five minute conversations between strangers and how little of that conversation is about conveying facts and information. Only 36 percent, in fact. The rest of it is all just agreeing, acknowledging uh, or appreciating what the other person is saying. And I, I thought this was really interesting. It kind of confirms things that we maybe think that we know, but um, explains them in a, in a very clear and quite thought provoking way. A solution to this, the article suggests at the end, is uh, for everyone to, to realize how much language is non-propositional um, and in the course of a conversation to constantly say to whoever you're speaking to, are you expressing yourself or proposing a fact? This could revolutionise a cycling podcast. Well, it, this? may not make for charming conversation, as the article says, but it may prevent misunderstandings. Right. Well, well, we have corrections corner in the event of misunderstandings, don't we? <laughs> so, uh, well, if you want to get a free print copy of The Economist delivered to you and you're in the UK, you can text the word cycling to 78070. That's cycling to 78070. Well, Daniel, I'm still digesting your, your your list, which you delivered in rapid fire there. And there I wasn't really time. I did not want to write that down and post <laughs> it on the internet. <laughs> I'm going to transcribe not. it. I'm going someone, to transcribe it. Yeah, someone it will write it down. I think the, the problem with your list, Daniel, is that it, the flaw is that it's, it's solely focused on past performance, predicting future events. And, and as we know from cycling, somebody will come along mm. and make a mockery. And ride, we'll basically ride a but coach and horses through your list. But that's how probability works, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very basic concept. I know you've been ill, but he, he's only, it's, he not, can, it's not that he difficult can, to understand. He can really only go on the evidence that there is rather than the evidence that doesn't exist yet. So, you know, you, the, there'll be other people alive who will win Grand Tours. Somebody, they might not even not have ridden a bike of. yet. Somebody, there'll be the next, the next Pogachar will come along, and, and could be Maxi Moore. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, well, one person who wasn't on your list, Daniel, was T.J. Van Garderen. Hmm. Um, no, although T.J. Van Garderen, um, it always shocks me to to realise how young T.J. Van Garderen still is. Twenty-three. He's, uh, no, he's, he's. I think he's thirty. Yeah, I was joking. Um, yeah, he is. Last August. He's he's been around for a while, and he has uh, embarked on a on a fresh chapter this year with EF Education First after several years at BMC. I think it'll be interesting to see how he gets on because, as we've talked about a lot, BMC is a, a was a team with quite a rigid sort of hierarchy and a, a system of of riding. And EF Education First is certainly a team where there's maybe a bit more room for individuality and and maybe a bit less pressure as well uh, so we uh, dispatched our man tom wally our ace producer and you you may recognize tom tom's voice from the explorer series of podcasts as well but tom went to the ef education first training camp in girona last week and did a few interviews for us and uh, spoke to tj van gardner about rebooting his career and about the that kind of eternal conflict between writing for GC and writing for stages and where he stands on that. This team, obviously, um, you're, you're new here, it seems like, <coughs> judging from speaking to other riders and, and hearing interviews and stuff, it seems like quite a free-spirited team, um, sort of that embraces the idiosyncrasies of the riders. Have, have you noticed that? Yeah, um, there's definitely, uh, you know, riders are encouraged to express their identities and um, and you know kind of just just have an identity and you know be themselves and and yeah i think that's great D does that suit you as a rider yeah i mean i will i just i definitely i i wouldn't say i'm as uh i'm as out there as some of the other guys with the mullets and mustaches and everything but um but yeah i, I definitely I definitely feel like i'm free to be myself and express myself here um, so I mean, we're talking about um, the, the, the team and the sort of the, the free spiritedness. Obviously, they've got this alternative race calendar that's sort of cropped up, been talked about. Is that anything that you're going to be a part of? Have you got other eyes on other types of races that you might want to do? Um, the one, I mean, it's not on my calendar as of right now. But the one that um, that I think would be cool would be the Leadville 100 because it's. It's after the tour, so it doesn't interfere with any sort of preparation um, in that regard. And, you know, I live 
right close to Aspen, so it's just it's just over the hill from where I live. So I'd I'd go home and have good fitness from the tour. So it'd be it'd be a fun race to kind of hop into. So you, you've mentioned the tour then. Is that the tour is on your program for this year then? Um, as of now, yes. Obviously, getting closer to the to the event, anything can change. You have you have to be showing good form at the time, and you know. A lot can happen from now till July, but uh, the season's planned as if I'm doing the tour. Yeah. And at this new team, um, what's your what's your role here? Are you, I mean, you're going to be the team leader for the for stage races. Uh, what, you, what? How do you define your role here? I mean, right now I'm more focused on just getting into the races and you know getting getting some results and uh, getting to know the guys and getting my legs back underneath me. As far as roles go and leaderships and, you know, these, this team has its, its established leaders for the classics and obviously Rigo for the tour. So um, <clears throat> we'll just see where I slot in based on how the year is going. Do you, does, does GC still motivate you? Well, I mean, after I remember you, when you win, won that stage in the Giro, uh, you seemed completely rejuvenated and maybe changed to a, a more of a stage hunting. No, rider. GC still motivates me. Does it? It's it's not that stage hunting, it's not that stage wins don't inspire me, but how you have to race in order to be stage hunting doesn't inspire me. Because uh, you can hop in one of those breakaways and, you know, if you win the stage and you put your arms in the air, it's an amazing feeling. But those other 20 days of the race, when you are, when you don't make the breakaway and you're in the gruppetto and your mind's kind of switched off and you're just kind of slugging to the line, it's, uh, it makes the race really, really long. Um, so I'd rather be... I'd rather be fighting every day and mentally engaged on a day-to-day basis. Otherwise, it's just it's just the suffering that you have to go through just to get to the line and finish it day by day. It's it's not a very fun way to race. That's interesting and, to hear that because after you after you won that stage, a lot of the, the commentators just interpreted it as you know you're completely reborn. This was what you were going to do for the rest of your career. It's not not the case at all. No, I mean. Um, it's one of those things where if something happens and GC falls away, then you have to, in your mind, stay motivated and say, okay, now this is the new goal. And once that happens, then you have an opportunity to go for stage wins. But to say, like, I am no longer focusing on GC at all, screw GC, like, no, not at all. Not at all. Um I think, uh, yeah, it's like I said, I, I've, I've had grand tours where, you know, GC has fallen away and I've tried to stage hunt and it's, it's a feeling like none other when you can actually win that stage the way I did in the Giro. But, um, those other 20 days, man, they, they, they're no fun when you're not in really engaged on a day to day basis. Yeah, interesting stuff from Van Garden there, and sort of echoes what I was trying to say about um, Simon Yates enjoying the Giro and the Vuelta more, in, in the sense that um, if you're riding for GC, particularly in the Tour, there's an awful lot of very difficult waiting around, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, hard, hard yards to, um, to race, but the, the thing about that is that the focus is always, always on, um, whereas, you know, if you can just loosen the reins and then and just go for some stage wins lots of days will lose all definition entirely so it's, a, it, it it's horses for though. courses isn't it yeah that did strike me as um, the point of view line of someone who's never had to really work as a domestique though um, as soon as I heard him say that that mm. you know, you, yeah. you just don't focus on the other days well you know there are riders in the peloton who who go after stage wins and then do a job for their teammates on other days yeah, it's true, and I guess it depends what team you're in and whether you have a a rider who's going to need that sort of support um, day in, day out. But I, I could complete, and it's, it boils down to personality types as well, doesn't it? And and I, you know, I, I can imagine somebody um, finding, you know, we, we often sneer a little bit in a, in a good natured way about riders who ride a la Zubeldia into seventh, eighth, ninth overall in GC and. 
and wonder what what the what the point is. But from a personal sort of satisfaction point of view, I can I can imagine that riding like that and and feeling that you're ticking off the days and doing everything that you can and hard uh, would, and would intense, be, but without yeah, but but sort of fulfilling as well. You know, you you always have a focus, don't you? Always have a focus, yeah. And and I, again, I think the 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 thing not to misunderstand about our light-hearted joke about riding Ala Zubeldia is, it, you know, it's not easy. You know, that's that's the difference, isn't it? You know, um, and the, particularly in the tour, I think um, riders get sort of kettled into that way of riding because a, a finish finishing seventh or eighth in the tour, if it's uh, equaling or bettering the previous best result, is um, you know, life changing, career changing, certainly could be salary changing. And um, so, you know, and the Van Garderen as well, it, it, with when he was at BMC, did look like he had that, that pressure on him to be the, the team leader when perhaps didn't have the personality type for the, the, all of the pressure that goes with it. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, it'd mean, be interesting. I, I feel sorry for Van Garderen because, you know, he's a victim of his own precocious success in the sense that he was fifth in the tour at 24 years of age and then you know you create your expectations for yourself and you create expectations on 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 the part of your team and and teammates and you're you're almost condemn them then to 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 go for gc um for the rest of your career whether it be in the tour or the giro or or the vuelta and um you know a lot of the time with vanguard and people and including members of staff in uh, bmc for example um have, have sort of been exasperated because they've looked at his you know he's he's looked very down when things have not been going well he's sort of internalized um, his his own disappointment and it's it's kind of radiated out and created uh, a less than ideal atmosphere in the rest of the team but you know would you rather have someone who is disappointed with their own failures or, or, um, you know, or and shows that or would you have someone who, who you know doesn't care that he's making his teammates ride on the front um, all day and then you know getting dropped three kilometers um, up a up a big climb and, and and losing a lot of time and i think that a lot of the time you know he, he um he has been stressed and he has been disappointed because he he has expected better of of himself and you know he's kind of in been in the same quandary that richie port has had whereby people say well what two ingredients go into being a good grand tour rider they're time trialing and climbing um, and they completely ignore and, and overlook that there's a whole other component which is about recovery and focus and and just constructing a three-week race and that's where he he has fallen short but no because he's a he's a really good time trial he's a really good climber and people have just expected him to be one of, you know, one of the best in the world and and you know the uh, and i think that this this stress as you said rich it's it's also been channeled into his way of racing um you know i remember a conversation i had with bram tankink the lotto yumba at the time uh, rider a couple of years ago and at the jira and he said you know he, he'd never seen s- someone look so stressed in the peloton as tj van Garder, and he was desperately you know trying to uh, striving to to be on a teammate's wheel throughout the whole stage every day and it, you could just see the stress in in his face um and you know, I don't think that was that was easy for him. And now he's gone to a team with a completely opposite approach. And we'll see how that works out. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thanks to our great supporters, Science and Sport. A reminder that you, the listener, can get twenty five percent off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com using the code at the checkout. SISCP25 and we know lots of you take advantage of that and please continue to do so. Um, Each week we're also taking a question and putting it to the science and sport experts. This week's question comes via a voice memo uh, to our WhatsApp number. That number again plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two oh five so you can leave a voice memo with a question or email us contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. And this week's question comes from Germany. We'll hear the question and then we'll hear from Ben Samuels of Science and Sport. Hello and good morning from Germany. This is Konstantin with a question regarding gluten-free nutrition, especially with my problems regarding lactose intolerance and somewhat of an allergic reaction towards almonds. 
I do feel that living a healthy diet has become increasingly difficult whilst trying and having to avoid gluten as well. So are there any suggestions for recipe books or nutritional ideas on how to live on a lactose-free, gluten-free and non-almond diet? Thanks and have a good ride. Interesting question, Constantine. And with such dietary restrictions, it can seem quite daunting at first. An approach to day-to-day -day nutrition would be to understand the foods that you can have and which food groups those fit into. And from there, you can start to develop your general intake. So foods are often classified by their macronutrient, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats being the three big ones. There are then a range of micronutrients that are important in a balanced diet. Suitable carbohydrate options for yourself would include certain varieties of rice, potatoes, quinoa, gluten-free breads, gluten-free pasta. Those can all be used to satisfy your daily energy and carbohydrate requirements. Protein intake can then come from meat, fish, eggs, tofu or soy based alternatives and it's important that you get a good protein feeding with every meal. There's then a range of fruits and vegetables that should be included on a day to day basis to meet your micronutrient needs and finally fats from seeds, avocados, different oils, olives and animal products. Overall, it's, it's understanding really what you need, um, how this breaks down into foods that are suitable for yourself and piecing them together in a day-to-day -day plan and, and really building around that. When it comes to endurance exercise and time on the bike, Sanctin Sport energy gels, energy powders and hydro tablets are all vegan and therefore suitable for yourself. So this weekend is Het Newsblad and Kern and Brussels Kern, let's not forget. Um, we're going to hear from Seth Van Mark, who's a former winner at Het Newsblad, in a moment or two. Um, Lionel, you're heading out there. One thing that's caught my eye already, um, Bora Hansgrohe announced their team yesterday, uh, and it doesn't include Peter Sagan, um, who usually rides Het Newsblad and is usually up there. Um, and I, I thought that was interesting. Um, we've talked about Sagan maybe going for Liège-Bastogne-Liège -Liège this year, and I wondered if this is part of that um, effort to just delay his his uh, his his debut in the cobbled classics um, a little bit to allow him to maybe extend that or mo shift the window of form uh, a little bit to include Liège Baston Liège. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, you say, Rich, that he usually rides. He, he's kind of alternated. Um, last year he didn't do this opening weekend there have been a couple of other years when he hasn't done it but some when where he has but as you say I think it's probably got a lot to do with him wanting to have a pop at Liege Baston Liege I actually I forgot they didn't ride last year so it was two years ago I think he was second or third he was certainly up there in the break with Greg Van Avermaet when he won it yeah was that the year he arrived at the press conference with Harry, he'd raced with hairy, hairy legs, legs hadn't he the race That's before right. yeah. yeah and everyone was wondering whether he'd shave his legs Mm. Then he turned up to the start in leg warmers. Could be right, but Lionel, it could be bathed in warm sunshine. Which I was there last year, and it was—I've never been as cold in my life as I was on Sunday morning in Kerno. Uh, it was uh, unbelievably cold. This this weekend could be very different. Yeah, uh, well, it's very spring-like, isn't it? Um, Twenty plus degrees here in London, slightly. Sp slightly sinister well temperature. less than well, sli not well, slightly less, less than more now, more than slightly sinister it's 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 unnerving it is unnerving isn't it um whether it will affect the racing too much i don't know i mean uh, makes it a lot easier if it's not freezing cold and or raining well, clearly um and for the riders <laughs> yeah exactly the riders as well um yeah it's, it's always interesting very reluctant to get involved in um any kind of predictions it's the first the first opportunity just to see who has got the, the their preparation bit right where they are now but we know we know from history that Omloop Het Newsblad doesn't really tell us a great deal um, when it comes to the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix they're, they're no, nobody's the ever won Het Newsblad and Tour of Flanders have they in the same year yeah no pretty sure that's still correct yeah. mm. and remark that's a remarkable statistic well, there's a, a month between them, isn't there? And there's an extra 60 kilometres in the Tour of Flanders. They're quite different events. I think that that's assuming that they're, you know, like for like is, well, it's not. They're not, are they? They're very different races. No, but they're similar, <laughs> similar roads and, you know, same part of the world. 
Anyway, um, shall we hear from Seth Van Mark, who is a former winner of Het Newsblad, and one of these guys who, I mean, he's finished on the podium Pyro Bay as well. He, he's somebody who I think has, it's always been felt that at some point in his career he would win Flanders or Roubaix or both, and has has not done so yet. And he's had he's had a lot of bad luck um, over the years. Um, and he's been there or thereabouts, but that big win has eluded him. So he is preparing for another tilt at the classics. He he was uh, well, he won in the Tour de Haute Var um, uh, in France, so he got his season off to a good start. And uh, he's made some changes as well for this year. Here's what he had to say at the EF Education First training camp in Girona. Um, yeah, for the moment I feel good. Um, yeah, the plan was to start in Bessege and uh, that went well. It was not, not a really hard, uh, hard race, so that was nice uh, to get into the season. Um, now I did just did Provence, that was a lot harder. I suffered a lot. And uh, that will only be good for uh, yeah for the condition for the next months. But I'm happy with uh, my condition now. Uh, I'm not normally not on my top level yet. Shouldn't be. And um, and so hopefully in the next few weeks and months I'll uh, still get better. And obviously your your major uh, goals this season come early as always in the classics. Um, uh, have you changed your approach to them this year, or you, do, do you stick to the same sort of routine, same training, same schedule? Uh, yeah, some things have changed. Uh, the biggest change is uh, that I changed coaches, and uh, the first time since 12 years. I was really happy with the coach I had, like like with his way of coaching, and, and, and uh, I had some great results also because of him. But it was. Um, yeah, the team, like like we said before, they changed a lot and became more and more professional. And one of the changes also uh, through performance um, is that, that they want to have every rider trained or coached by a coach that is involved in the team. So that was also their request. And of course, uh, um, I'm part of the team and I don't want to... Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to say. It. I don't want to fight against it or anything. Um, so now I change coaches, and maybe after 12 years, it's maybe a good step also for my career, just to have like some different types of training or different things to do. And maybe my body accepts it very well, and I go better. Uh, that's what I hope. But of course, with a different coach, there's a different way of training and. Um, some things have changed, yeah. And obviously, the classics are your your main objective. Um, what would a victory in one of the big classics mean to you? Oh, that would mean a lot, yeah, for sure. It's um, I wouldn't say since I was a child that I was dreaming about that. That's not true because I never thought I would be professional. Um, I was just cycling and riding my bike because I loved it and never thought about that I would be able to uh, become a professional rider. But then since, um, yeah, since my first year, things were going well in the classics, second year, third year also, then I won Omloop at Newsblad. And from then on, you start thinking about uh, the big classics, and um, that's already a while ago, and I'm still fighting for it. So um, let's say in the beginning of my professional career, people said like, oh, for sure you're going to win, and you're going to win uh, multiple times, and this and that, and... After a while, you start to believe it. Like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm really close. And um, but now I'm 30 years old and still didn't win a big classic. And I've always been close. I think every cobbled race I start, uh, I'm, I'm with the favorites in the front. I'm one of the favorites, and I've, yeah, I've been on many podiums and many top fives. But just uh, winning is hard for me. And uh, so. It would be a dream come true uh, now in the end if I would finally uh, win one ra- one big race. Do you ever does does doubt ever creep in that you can win one, or do you always still believe that you can? I, I for sure I still believe um, because it's not that I'm far away from winning. I'm, I'm a couple of years ago when uh, Cancellara was uh, on his top level, I was like one of the few guys that could follow him or uh, like w- when he won the last time uh, Pere Roubaix he beat it me uh, when he won the last time Tour of Flanders I was third he beat it me in the sprint and, and Van Avermaet so uh, since then until now I'm, I'm always in the battle for the for the win 
so for sure if I just yeah or I need to be a bit stronger or I need to make right choices but most of all I think I just need to have the luck on my side uh, where there's a gap and they let me go for a, or they dialed it for a second and um, or I have just a super day where I can uh, push a little bit harder push a little bit longer and um, yeah, if I, I think the day I stop believing it, then I better stop cycling. So Sepp Van Mark there, um, one of the favourites for Saturday's Het News Blad, and you know, looking ahead to the Flanders and Roubaix, will be one of the favourites there as well. You imagine um, he has changed coaches. He didn't seem completely happy about that. This is something that, he, as he mentioned in the interview, a lot of teams are now insisting that that coaching has is brought in house, and that riders aren't working with people who are not. Um, directly connected to or employed by the, the his, team. His old coach, which was a gentleman called Luke Wante, no relation to Wante Group Goubert. <laughs> glad you, glad you cleared that up. Um, yeah, and he's been with him a long time, so that's quite a big change, uh, you would think, for him. But then a rider like Sepp Van Mark, um, y- you do feel, and I'm sure the team felt that it, it was worth trying something new because. Um, it, it has looked that he's been in a bit of a, a rut um, I mentioned the bad luck he has had some unfortunate crashes and punctures and so when he's looked really strong uh, but uh, there aren't, he doesn't have many more chances to win one of these big races and I spoke to his DS Andres Clare a few weeks ago um, he is, of course he was second at Flanders in 2005 wasn't he Clare um, he's DS now at EF Education first and he was talking about just how these races are, are ridden now often doesn't suit Van Mark because he's tended to play a bit of a waiting game and we're seeing now that riders are going out there striking early I mean uh, uh, Sagan at Pyro Bay last year went with about 55, 60 kilometres to go Gilbert, Philippe Gilbert Flanders a year before about 60 kilometres to go, 70 kilometres to go um, it does seem like the uh, the selection has, has been brought forward a bit and Van Mark, if he's going to win one of these races, might have to get involved a little bit earlier. I think Van Mark's biggest problem is that whenever he gets to the finish in the final group of whether it's two, three, four or five, he tends to not be the quickest. Um, Out sprinted a a lot of times by uh, Cancellara at Paris-Roubaix, by Cancellara and Van Avermaet at Tour of Flanders, um, by Van Avermaet, Sagan at Omloop Het Newsblad in the past and you know they're just the ones that are off the <coughs> top of my head it, it's hard it, you can be the you can be built for these races but it, when it comes down to the finish if you're not alone um, and the other guy is quicker it's very hard to win I know that sounds really obvious and simplistic but that's the kind of the, the, the mould of Sepp Van Mark um, that's who he, who he is and so um, yeah maybe he does need to get involved in the, the, the preliminary phase of the end game rather than waiting and waiting and waiting and I mean there's nothing new with this kind of with it kicking off um, certainly in the Tour of Flanders with sort of 60-70 kilometres to go I mean quick step a few years back made it almost their sig- signature move um, you know, Devolder or Chavanel would go in that first wave um, knowing that they had Tom Bonin uh, sitting and waiting. I mean that you know that's the ideal scenario um, for for the team, and it's why Quick Step now De Kernick Quick Step have always been so strong in these races because they've had numbers and they can afford to um, participate fully in any phase of the race and they can take it on. Whereas Van Mark has always been uh, more on his own. I yeah, guess. I mentioned opportunities might be running out for him, but I guess he, he's almost been too strong for his own good and so it's been very difficult for him to move his best chances might come as his powers or as others think that his powers wane and you know he may be given license to get him one of these early moves that like Matt Heyman did a couple of years ago at Pyro Bay and uh, but he'll have to alter his the, the way that he approaches these races and his mindset I think going into them which uh, could be the bigger challenge maybe who knows um, but yeah I mean it's sorry it's Daniel also the it's also the question of his team isn't that I mean um you know, they should be shaping up fairly well with Langevelt and Finney, who we had an interview with, but we're going we're gonna to hear that in a few weeks, aren't we, Rich? Yeah, we, with I mean, Taylor Finney on Pyra Bay is... Um, I mean, that's one, that is one different dude. One for the ages, I listened that. To, I yeah. listened to that interview, and 
Strange things are afoot outside the EF education bus, to paraphrase a famous 90s movie. Uh, yeah, so, you, know. you, you went off and... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's an inter- it's an inter- some interesting thoughts from uh, Taylor Finney on training and visualising and so on. But that's that's a few weeks down the tracks. Um, Lionel, mm. who's going to win? Het Newsblad. Oh, uh, that, Van Avermaet. Uh, <laughs> Van Avermaet. Do you want me to do my top eighteen? Um, <laughs> oh. Right, is likely to win on loop Het Newsblad between now and the end of time. <laughs> no, no, I'm not doing that. I think Van Avermaet will win. Yeah, that's a good shout. He looks, he looks good. Um, yeah. Any, any, any advances on Van Avermaet? I'm looking forward to finding out. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Valgren, maybe again. He's he's also looked pretty well, sharp. Defending it's, champion. It's, it's a race where people have got on little runs. They're looking back, uh, Van Pettigen won in '97 and '98. Um, Stannard won in 2014 and '15. Van Avermaet himself won in '16 and '17. So yeah, he wouldn't rule out a, a back-to-back for Michael Valgren. Um, moved teams, hasn't he? Of course, Dimension Data now uh, from Astana. Um, but maybe he's got his eye on um, the races a bit later on in the spring. Who knows? Sure he does. Shall we uh, wrap things up for this week, fellas? We'll be back next week. I think we might have... I can't remember what we've got next week, but we'll, we'll have you from Het Newsblad. We will. How could I forget? I, I think there might be... I don't want to over-promise and under-deliver here, but I think there'll probably be some form of Friends of the Podcast special episode from opening weekend in Belgium. Um, hoping to get that online on Monday morning. Great. We'll, we'll see. Great. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much, and have a good weekend and. Belgium, Lionel. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps. Just before we go, we're starting a new thing this week, actually copying other podcasts and saying thanks to some of you who have been good enough to sign up as a friend of the podcast. You can become a friend at thecyclingpodcast.com, of course, and as well as receiving exclusive episodes for friends of the podcast, your support helps us make the podcast and get to races, including all three grand tours. To say thanks, we're going to pick some names at random to mention as we play out. So this week... Uh, my thanks to Mark Heed and Cooper Shanks. Thanks to Blake Thompson and Simone Bone. And thank you to Ryan Clark and Lynn Jones. You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Tom Wally.